And welcome to the Steve Marlsberg Show. Steve, as you can tell, has extended his July 4th holiday weekend. He's not here. We are. I'm Bill Tucker. You might recognize me from my days as a business reporter on CNN. I'm now a Forbes.com contributor and a frequent guest on Newsmax TV's The Daily Wrap. I'm joined by my co-host, Amy Holmes, news anchor for The Blaze TV and former speechwriter for former Senate Majority Leader Bill Frist. Thank you for joining us today. We're going to kick things off with the political commentator Mickey Kaus, founder of KausFiles.com. Mickey, thanks for joining us. But before we get to you, I want to start with a piece of sound from Secretary of State John Kerry over the weekend talking about the Iran nuclear deal. And well, he says it best. We are not yet where we need to be on several of the most difficult issues. And the truth is that while I completely agree with Foreign Minister Zarif that we have never been closer, at this point, this negotiation could go either way. So, Mickey, what happened here? This used to be a big deal. They wanted to run this through without even having to get congressional approval, and now suddenly they're making sounds like, well, we're far apart here. We don't necessarily need this deal. Antipathy is suddenly the word I'd use here. Mickey, what's going on? Well, I think this is a standard end of negotiation tactic. Uh, we also are brandishing our bunker buster bombs all of a sudden. Uh, and, and we have the Secretary of Defense saying, you know, they were designed to penetrate Iran's most uh, buried nuclear facilities. I, so I, I don't think he could read much into it one way or the other. If Kerry was going to cut a deal, this is what he would say. And if he wasn't going to cut a deal, this is what he would say. I do think I have a crude Washington pundit's view of this, which is, the, you know, Obama is desperate for a legacy. Kerry is desperate for a legacy. The fact that Obamacare survived the Supreme Court and this gay marriage thing went through actually takes some of the pressure off because Obama's running around saying he's the he's he's like Reagan, he's transformed America, and that he doesn't really need the Iran deal as much as he did before. Now, am I saying that crude ego, egotistical calculations have an effect on international <laughs> diplomacy? Yes, that's what I'm saying. Exactly. Of course you I, are. I, I like that counterintuition that this actually takes pressure off of Obama to get some sort of deal. But speaking of uh, crude, narcissistic, uh, brazen, brash <laughs> <laughs> politics, we have the Donald, and he's doing very well among Republican voters in polling. He's number two behind Jeb Bush, and he's been making a lot of noise about illegal immigration. You're down there in Los Angeles near the front lines of the uh, immigration battles, quite literally, and it's one of the topics that you cover extensively on your blog, CowsFiles.com. Do you think that Donald is helping the discussion in shining a light on this issue? I tend not to think that because he spoke so crudely and managed to offend uh, you know Hispanic Americans and Hispanics generally that he's made the focus him and I and I, I worry that f first he all other people will back off and second uh, that he will somehow uh, get all this support from people who really want uh, the government to get serious about illegal immigration and to I enforce the border first and then he'll sell out he's already started to sell out when he said uh, oh well they get to stay if they're good workers well who decides if they're good workers I mean he's obviously winging it uh, in his egomaniacal fashion <laughs> and, no, uh, really? and, uh, and you know and that, that means he's uninformed and he will he will flop back in the other direction uh, we had two candidates, Scott Walker and Cruz, who were going to sort of compete for this constituency, and I think I would have preferred it if uh, if the, if it had just rested with them. On the other hand, I should say, voters, there's an appeal of somebody who's extreme, even racist, on issues like this. Look at the support David Duke got when he ran in Louisiana, and the reason is they figure. Everybody sells out. You know, we have we have establishment politicians. They say the right things in immigration. They get to Washington and sell out. If he's a crazy, kooky racist, at least we know he's unlikely to sell out. <laughs> Be consistent. Uh, okay. He's so, a crazy, consistent. kooky racist. Yeah. Uh, I don't think I don't think Trump is a racist, but there yeah. is an appeal of somebody who's a kook. But, you know, well, when you call an entire group of people and color them with the word rapist, you know, it's not too hard to apply the word if, racist if you, right if, after that. But. If you reread what he said, there's a 10% there's a chance that 
that you know when he said that he was just talking about the bad people yeah. they send are rapists. I mean, well, I, that, that happens. I'm not a Trump supporter. That happens to be my my opinion on this. But I want to ask you about a really bizarre analysis of these statements, because on the internet out there, there is now some speculation that Donald Trump, by his extremism and by his language, is actually helping Jeb Bush, because it pushes Jeb to the forefront. It makes him appear more reasonable, more moderate, and hey, he has got an interracial marriage, he's married to a Mexican woman. Is this just weird internet talk, Mickey, or is I don't, there something about I mean, Jeb was always moderate, and he was always going to get the, the votes of people who were moderate, but uh, it, it let him have a macho moment where he seemed <laughs> to put down Trump. Uh, which is always good for a politician. Right, well, so, to put down I, Trump and also protect his wife, we like that. I mean, you remember right. uh, Michael Dukakis, a man you worked for, if I might add, uh, and his terrible non-answer to protecting his family. Uh, but let me move on to your side of the aisle. You, were, you uh, often describe yourself as a self-loathing liberal. How do you feel about the Bernie Sanders phenomenon and that he seems to be uh, generating quite a, bu quite a bit of heat? I like the Bernie Sanders phenomenon, uh, even though I, I probably disagree with the left wing of my party. A, Sanders has always been relatively, relatively good on immigration. He worries about mass immigration uh, reducing the wage levels of Americans, and, and stagnant wages are the big issue now, and immigration has something to do with it. So he's sort of to the right of Hillary on that issue. He's also, uh, you know, wants to make a big deal of punishing Wall Street and re-regulating Wall Street, and I'm not antithetical to that. I think there's a tremendous potential for left-right uh, sort of uh, cooperation on that on that populist issue. Uh, and I think he's got, if you look at the polls now, you would say he's going to beat Hillary in New Hampshire. He's behind now, but it's, you know, the election's a long way off, and he's already at 30 percent. So, uh, he, and he's a neighboring, from a neighboring state. So, I, I find it, I, I like the fact that he's shaking up the race. I like the fact that he's forcing Hillary to define herself. Uh, he, you know, he's, he's, if he wins New Hampshire and Iowa, I don't see why Hillary just sails through. I think somebody else like Biden or Bloomberg jumps in. Well, I was going to ask, is he for real in, in the sense he could really get the nomination? Because if he is, doesn't he run the danger of dragging the entire Democratic Party so far left? That yes. the rest of America goes, wait, I, we, we can't go there with you. You're a lot of fun, but we're not voting for you. Yes, I think that happens. But I think if he does as well as I think he's going to do, then somebody else jumps in the race, and either Biden or Bloomberg or probably both. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have a free-for-all among more moderate people. Right, we've got uh, Jeb, uh, Jim Webb jumping in, Martin O'Malley eyeing it. You know, a possibility that I'm not hearing enough people talking about or asking Senator Sanders about is possibly being the Ross Perot to Hillary Clinton mm -hmm. in a general. It only takes a few points, as we know, to knock that front runner, uh, knock their prospects out and pull in the second runner. So is Hillary Clinton, do you think she's a little afraid that Bernie Sanders might want to hang on to to his fans, his money, and his popularity in a general. He's a registered independent after all. Uh, I think she's a little scared of that, and I, I assume that he will be forced to say uh, whether he would do that or not, and uh, the party will not look kindly if he preserves the option of running as an independent. The guy who's really terrifying is Trump on the right. Uh, that's, why they're, that's one of the reasons why they're all being so nice to him. He has the money and the ego to mount an independent campaign, and he would kill the Republicans because he polls well enough uh, that four or five percent could tip the balance. Fascinating, Mickey. Thank you very much. We're going to have to run. Fortunately, we're up against a wall, but thank you for taking time to talk to us today. Thank you. It's been fun. It has been. It's been a good so time. Much. All right. Up next for the Hill, or excuse me, writer for the Hill will be Brent Bukowski. He'll be talking about Hillary and we'll continue our conversation about Hillary and, and, and what she may be up to. What's interesting and we didn't get a chance to mm -hmm. get into with Mickey was that uh, Trump got, came out over the weekend and oh. told union leaders don't go endorsing Bernie Sanders. Oh, all and right. And he issued a note to them saying... You think he got a phone call from the Clintons? I don't know. Maybe he could have been. <laughs> the powers of being are starting to swing. All of that coming up next. Stay with us.